It is an honor and privilege for the Associated Student Speakers Program to have as our guest today the Honorable Gerald Ford. Representative Ford was elected Minority Leader of the House of Representatives at the opening of the 89th Congress in 1965. He has been a member of the Republican Policy Committee for seven years and has served as a member of the Joint Senate House Republican Leadership since January 1963. The topic of today's address will be the future of the Republican Party and following Representative Forbes, Ford's presentation, you're invited to attend an informal coffee hour next door in the men's lounge. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the Honorable Gerald Ford. Some comments concerning the future of the Republican Party. I've been on your campus before and have enjoyed uh, meeting members of the faculty and the student body, and I commend you for all that I know about the inquisitive attitude and the open mind and the vigor with which you participate in public affairs. I have looked at the uh, previous agenda, the speakers who have uh, been here in the past, and uh, I know a number of them. Uh, one in particular I think uh, might be worth mentioning. We have a limited number of similarities, although we do have a substantial number of differences. And I speak here of uh, Senator Wayne Morris of the state of Oregon. <laughs> Let me say that uh, I'll mention our areas of similarity at the outset and perhaps mention some of our differences uh, before proceeding. Uh, I, like Senator Morris, uh, strongly believe that members of the Congress, Democrat and Republican, uh, ought to get out and speak to and join in discussions with the students and faculties of our universities and colleges throughout the country. He and I have been on several panels. We've been on several programs together. Uh, and I think uh, even though we differ, uh, we have learned to disagree without being disagreeable. And I think this is a point all of us ought to well take into consideration. Another similarity was that we both started as Republicans. Uh, we uh, are no longer members of the same political party but uh, we had our initiation in the political arena in the same political party. We also have another similarity which I think is mighty important to all of you and is a matter of fact important uh, to the country as a whole. Both of us believe that the right of dissent and disagreement is one that must be protected and to some degree sponsored. I think both of us would differ with a format of a consensus government. And if I read his speeches in the Senate, uh, he disagrees as I do with many of the political and philosophical views of the present administration, which seeks to be a consensus government. Our differences uh, are somewhat uh, broad and perhaps by my observations they will become evident, so I won't discuss them uh, individually. I'm delighted that it was suggested that I talk about the Republican Party. I happen to feel first and foremost that it's the most healthy thing in this country to have two strong competitive political parties. All of us, I believe, uh, feel that our form of government is probably preferable to any in the world. I concede there are deficiencies. I admit there are areas where we could do better. But on a comparative basis with any other nation that I've ever visited or ever studied, we in America are far better off than any other group of citizens in any other nation. Now, there are many reasons for this. 
And one of the reasons why we have made the progress we have, one of the reasons why we have more freedom and opportunity than any other, is because we do have, or have had over the years, in most of the areas of the country, and in most times of our nation's history, a two-party system. The consumer in a society such as ours gets a better product if business has competition. And I know from my experiences as a lawyer that my clients got better results if I knew the opposing lawyer was a good one. And I have some reason to believe that our medical profession does a better job because they know that a patient can go to another doctor if he's not satisfied with the results. In other words, we can draw a proper analogy between business or a profession and say that the consumer or the client or the patient gets better results because of competition. And I think it's fair to point out that in the political arena, the public gets better results when there is competition. Now at the present time, I don't think the situation is such that we have competition. In the last election, uh, the political pendulum swung so violently that the majority party, the Democratic Party, not only controls the White House, but it controls the House and the Senate by better than two to one margins. And this in and of itself means that there is no competition in the Congress on how legislation should be programmed, how it should be fashioned, and what the end result should be. After the last session, I was asked many, many times for my impression, my evaluation of the worth or the merit of the Congress in 1965. And I would admit to you, as I said then, that I thought it did a poor job. I also said, however, that if you asked the president for his impression, why, it would be equally prejudiced politically. And so I searched repeatedly for what I would call an objective appraisal of the Congress. <coughs> and I found one, one that certainly would not be prejudiced uh, because of political identification. It's the impression of the Democratic majority leader of the Senate, Mike Mansfield. He was asked by Arthur Crock of the New York Times on September 21st, 1965, what he thought about the Congress in 1965. And here is what the Democratic Senate majority leader said last year. He said, and I quote, we have passed a lot of major bills at this session, some of them very hastily, and they stand in extreme need of a going over for loopholes, rough corners, and particularly for an assessment of current and ultimate cost in the framework of our capacity to meet it. Now, the only reason Senator Mansfield made that statement was because there was no real competition in either the House or the Senate. The Democratic Party had such overwhelming majorities that we, in the Republican side, with our skeletonized forces, were unable to offer the competition that would have forged good legislation. Now, a year ago in January, I got this new job as Minority Leader of the House by the landslide margin of 73 to 67. And ever since that time, I and a group of relatively young members of the House on the Republican side, working with Senator Dirksen and his Republicans on the Senate side, have tried to put together a point of view that will result in a restoration of a balance, a competitive situation in the Congress. And it appears to me that we're gradually achieving in the minds of the public 
a response that will bring some results in 1966. Let me very quickly point out what I think we have to do. In the first place, we have to get good candidates. And you have to get candidates who are looking forward and not backwards. I'm glad to point out, as I have visited 46 of the 50 states in 16 months, that our candidates are young. They are looking forward. They are willing to work for the cause that I think is crucial, this two-party system. Secondly, those of us who were fortunate enough to survive in 1964, and it was a rugged year, I would have to admit, uh, are trying in a, the only way that we know how to offer a responsible record to the public. So when decisions are made this November, the public will have an alternative. I think there are three areas that we can discuss here today that fall into this pattern of a responsible Republican Party, a party with a future. There are instances where the Republican Party will have to oppose either the aims or the objectives or the methods, maybe all. But we should not start out with the assumption that we will oppose everything that a Democratic administration proposes. I would have to concede that there are certain programs that uh, are generated by the Democrats that deserve support. On the other hand, there are some that we must oppose forthrightly. But secondly, and this is the area where I think the most work has to be done, Democrats as well as Republicans must concede that there are domestic problems, there are international problems that we have to face. You can't brush them under the rug. Now over the years, the Democrats have tried to create the impression that they are the only party of imagination, the only party that will come up with any solutions to these problems. I deny that they have a monopoly on ideas. And I can prove it in 1965 that we in the House on the Republican side were creative, were imaginative, we had good ideas for the solution of recognized problems. Let me take one at the beginning. The administration for years had been promoting what they called Medicare, it was really hospital care, to be financed by a payroll tax by those who are employed with rather limited benefits with mandatory provisions and with the benefits flowing to the well-to-do equally with those who were poor. In 1960, when this issue came before the House of Representatives, the Republicans in the House had an alternative and we call it a constructive alternative and I think History will prove that it was constructive and it was a better program than they submitted. It was to be financed out of general treasury funds, not on a payroll tax basis. Our proposal meant that those who paid the most taxes paid for it to a greater degree and those least able to pay paid less. Our proposal was not mandatory. Our proposal had better benefits, not only hospitalization, but it had medical benefits. Now this proposal was so attractive to the administration, they bought about 40% of it. They actually accepted the Republican portion that provided medical benefits. Now, they were so wedded to the payroll tax proposal that they couldn't abandon it. If they had been free from previous, from previous uh, commitments, I'm certain and positive they would have bought our proposal. A second area of a constructive alternative. The Republicans have long supported civil rights legislation. <laughs> President Eisenhower recommended in 1958 and Congress passed 
the first civil rights legislation in 65, 80 years, I've forgotten. Another Civil Rights Act was passed in 1960, another in 64, and in each instance the Republicans in the Congress gave a greater percentage support than the Democrats. And in 1965, there was a great furor created about voting rights. And the White House submitted early in 1965 a voting rights bill. It was very obvious from the outset for anybody who studied this White House proposal that it was inadequate. It actually affected only seven or eight states and excluded Texas. Why, I wouldn't know. <laughs> now, the Republicans in the House, the Republicans in the House put together a good voting rights bill that encompassed all 50 states, Illinois, Texas, and other states of the Union. And we included in our proposal a provision that said, yes, everybody ought to have the right to vote, but on the other hand, when a vote is cast, it must be counted honestly. This was not in the White House proposal. And when the White House proposal came to the floor of the House, the Republicans offered our provision from our bill to their proposal. And despite, despite the opposition of the Democrats on the House Committee on the Judiciary, it was approved and included in the Democratic bill. And it would be interesting reading, if you're concerned about it, to go back to the debate on the Kramer Amendment, where Chairman Seller, a Democrat, opposed the Kramer Amendment that provided for honest elections. Well, it was approved. It's in the law. Do you know what provision of, their, of the law they're using in Alabama today to make sure that the votes are counted honestly in that contested sheriff election? It's the Republican provision. A, pro, a provision which the White House didn't include, a provision which the Democrats fought. And I hope and trust this honest election provision is used in every state of the Union. It ought to be, regardless of which party may be in error. Well, I could go on with some other areas where I think the Republican Party has in the past 12 or 16 months under relatively new leadership given the voters of this country an opportunity of an alternative. There's one other area that I think is meritorious. As I said, we should oppose some programs forthrightly. We should offer constructive alternatives in others. In some cases, we should support a democratic president, and we should do it just as forthrightly. Basically, foreign policy should not be an area where there is a vast difference. And when we look at the circumstances we face as a nation today, I think we have to concede that this country is facing a great crisis in Southeast Asia. I don't believe at this point there is much to be gained to recollect how we got involved in South Vietnam. It started, as you know, back about 1947 or 48. It was primarily up until May of 1961, an economic and military assistance program. It's escalated now to a conflict of major proportions. I believe that this country is being challenged in Southeast Asia, particularly in South Vietnam, by communist terror and aggression. We in the Republican Party 
should not try to run the war. We shouldn't pick the targets. We shouldn't decide the weapons. This is why President Johnson was elected in 1964 as commander in chief. We should, in the Republican Party, say we'll back a policy that will forthrightly and honorably meet the challenge of communist aggression in Southeast Asia or Berlin or any place else. On the other hand, we should reserve the right to raise questions, to make broad suggestions. Just as I have tried to defend the right of students to protest responsibly, other citizens to speak out, I think we in the minority party have that right too. I should have said at the outset, because of my differences with the president over the last 12 or 15 months, and because of my current differences with the Secretary of Defense, that neither my remarks or my comments here have been cleared or will they be approved necessarily by the President or the Secretary of Defense. And I don't expect them to. We should, now that the President has committed 255,000 or 260,000 young men to Vietnam, we ought to make certain that their policies are the best for the nation's interest and for the protection of those that have been sent there. And if, they, if the Pentagon isn't mean, being managed properly, we ought to challenge them. And so should you, and so should the press of this country. They're not infallible. They have made mistakes. They have made serious errors in their comments from time to time, and they ought to be challenged, and we intend to do it. I repeat, however, this doesn't mean we should back off of a forthright stand on what our broad policy should be. Now, let me make one other comment, and then as I understand it, Roger, we are to go to another room for questions and answers. My memory goes back to 1939-1940, when I was a student at Yale University in the law school. And I can recall very vividly, in that period of our nation's history, Students at New Haven carrying signs such as, why die for Danzig? Why die for the Sudetenland? And I must confess that I was not too enthusiastic uh, to join the military or to be drafted. I didn't carry any signs, although I had some sympathy. But let me say that history proves, I feel, that those in those days who tended to erode a course of action of our country that would meet forthrightly the challenge of Nazism and Hitlerism and fascism, those who questioned our nation's course of action in meeting that challenge, I think, to some extent, to some extent, created some of the problems that our nation faced later. Because of our indecision in meeting the challenge of Hitlerism and Nazism and fascism in 1939, 40, and 41, we encouraged, encouraged some of the aggressive action that emanated from Hitler's Germany. And some of those people who were questioning why die for Danzig and Sudetenland may well have planted the seeds of Buchenwald and Belsen. 
I, don't, I would admit there's not a true and complete comparison between 1939 and 1965 and 66. But there's no difference in my judgment between the kind of dictatorial government that existed under Hitler and Mussolini and the other, and the kind of government that we see behind the Iron Curtain. They're both dictatorships. There was no freedom in Hitler's Germany or in Mussolini's Italy. And there is no freedom behind the Iron Curtain in the past or today. And we as a nation were right in our eventual action in meeting the challenge of Hitler. And I believe that we as a nation, if we believe in freedom, if we believe in our form of government, whether we like what we have to do, must just as forthrightly meet the challenge of communist aggression and terror. I think this is a crisis today as big as the one that we faced before. I would like to add this footnote. I don't feel that we should condemn those who protest the kind of a policy that I believe in or the policy that the president believes in. We should have the right of dissent and disagreement. We had it in 1939 and 1940. But I would only caution those who disagree and those who have a different viewpoint that they do it responsibly and constructively. There is a way for you who might feel differently to express your viewpoints, and I feel from my observations in politics and otherwise that you'll make more headway, and you'll come out with a better feeling yourself if you seek to educate in a constructive way. And some of the things that are being done in a few instances throughout this country on some college campuses and at the doorstep of the White House, I don't feel fit this pattern or formula that will bring the most support for your viewpoint. May I just conclude with this observation? This country, as I said at the outset, will be a better country if we have a two-party system with equal competition. And the one thing that you should avoid is failing to be a participant. There's an old comment or quote from the Italian poet Dante. The hottest places in hell are reserved for those who do nothing in a period of great moral crisis. I think this country faces a great moral crisis, faces a great international crisis. And it would be my one hope that all of you will not be neutral, be competitors in the party of your choice. And if you do, you and those to follow will be the beneficiaries. Thank you very much. <laughs>